the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy divine love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created. Now shall we the grace of Spirit. Let us pray. O God, who by the light of the Holy Ghost didst instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant us in that same Spirit that we may be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. God bless you all for being here. I know it's getting towards the busy season. And uh, to that end, we will then be on um, Christmas vacation until this, the Wednesday after Epiphany. I think the date is the 13th. So the next class will be the 13th of January then, okay? Your birthday, okay. To celebrate Charlie's birthday, remember if you bring anything, and have it be a cake with 39 candles on it. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so um, was it, was anybody not here last week, or is everybody au courant? Okay, well, for the ones who weren't, weren't here last week, we began chapter 8 on page 64, and um, we went as far as where it says the first commandment, pretty much. Uh, okay, so just to summarize that for you, though, we begin it with the commandments, and we started out with... Um, you know, charity, and you go, well, charity is not one of the Ten Commandments, no, but it's the great commandment, that you should love the Lord your God with your whole mind, your whole heart, your whole soul, etc., and your neighbor as yourself for love of God. So charity is the virtue that allows you to do that. So that's what, be, you know, the commandment to charity says you should love your Lord your God, etc., the virtue of charity, which is a supernatural virtue infused at baptism, is what allows you to have supernatural charity, okay? Now, um, like any growth in grace, it's not totally without some effort on your part that it grows. You, it is infused into your soul at baptism, and it is increased by, by doing good works and and receiving the sacraments and, you know, graces from God come into your soul. But it also involves a certain amount of, uh, you can close that door all the way out there. It, it involves a certain part of you doing your part. You have to actually consider what is the charitable response in many cases. And then you have to do it. You know, just because you have supernatural charity infused into your soul, uh, doesn't mean that it's going to have much effect on you without you exercising it, okay? It's kind of like a muscle. Yes, you're born with the muscle, but unless you do certain exercises, it's not going to develop into a, a big, you know, muscle that, like your bicep, right? And it's like, there's not going to be a, a Mr. Universe bicep by, just because you're born with the bicep. And that's the way that the that's the way God works on virtually everything. There's a saying, and it's meant to be a trite little saying, and sometimes it's used tritely, that God helps those who help themselves, but it is actually true. Those who exercise charity consciously will be met with a response by God to increase um, the graces in their souls. Okay, but uh, you know, there's it's always what I call the two prong approach. So we also begin with charity because <clears throat> all the commandments are comprised in the command to charity. If you have charity, think about it. If you're loving the Lord your God with your whole being, right? Mind, body, soul, heart, everything. And your neighbor as yourself because God commands you to do that. You're not going to do any of the sin. You're, you're not going to violate any of the commandments. You know, you're not going to steal, kill, lie, um, you know, whatever. You're, you're not going to do it if you're really exercising uh, charity. So that's why they put it first. Nextly, we have the works of mercy, mercy both physical and corporal. Um, I mean, corporal and spiritual. 
Now, anybody who really says that they love the Lord their God with their whole being uh, and has nothing to show for it is probably lying, I would say, or has a complete misconception of what loving the Lord our God with your whole heart and mind and soul means. You have to have something to show it for it. Why? Because we are saved by two things, faith and good works. You're not saved by faith alone. See, a Protestant would be totally happy with not doing anything to help anybody because they believe you could be saved by faith alone. So, oh yeah, I have faith. You know, I have, um, I have said that I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Well, to a Protestant, that's all they have to do then. Um, but really, Catholicism, Christianity has always taught that we're, that isn't enough. You are saved by faith and good works. So the good works are the manifestation of the love of God that is in you. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to become like a Mother Teresa or something like that. But it means you meet the opportunities of, of, that each day present, God present, presents us with, uh, with this, this generosity to do something for you because of God, but for your fellow man. And there's a number of things you can do. We ran over each and every one of those, so I won't you know, bother going over those again. Then that brought us to the Beatitudes. <coughs> now, the Beatitudes are listed there, and they're, they're, they're from the Gospel of St. Matthew. And um, they all have to do really with our focus on doing doing the works of mercy in this life because of what we gain pretty much in the afterlife for doing so, okay? So you look at it, really, it, 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 the Beatitudes all begin with blessed, blessed are this, the, you know, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, the, you know, the, the um, poor in spirit, and, et cetera. And then the, the, there's a second half to it, for they shall get something, right? Something good will happen to these people who are the blessed are ones. And the things that are going to happen to them are largely in the next life. It, it doesn't mean they're going to be rewarded here. Remember, when life gets rough, as it does at times for everybody here, that Christ never said, and the faith never taught, that um, you, you are going to have an easy time of it in this life that you're going to, because you're a Christian and follow God's will, have all the blessings you think you should have and everything um, dropping in your lap and, and having an easy time of it. Christ never promised that. Why? Because what we went over the other week too, original sin. And creation is messed up and people are messed up. But the Beatitudes are a statement of if you... If you do certain things and, and uh, support them, meaning bear them in this life, then you will, you will be rewarded in the afterlife. And, and that's what this is. Um, just as a, a further comment on the Beatitudes, I know you've all heard it before, but the Beatitudes is one of the few examples we have, the only one I can think of offhand, in the New Testament where Christ employs uh, he, basically Jewish Hebrew poetry. And, and it's, this is, like a Hebrew at the time would have read this and just said it was brilliant. It would have been like Hamlet's soliloquy or something like that, maybe even better. And you're going, well, how is this poetry? <coughs> um, in poetry in English and other languages too, I suppose, but we, we rhyme certain things, you know? We rhyme the ends of the words, and so it comes out, you know, like what we think of a poem, right? With, with meter and rhyme. In Hebrew, in, in old Hebrew poetry, in Aramaic in the old times, you know, back then, and in, in, in the Old Testament's full of, the, full of it as well, they could rhyme not only the, the sounds of the words, but also ideas. 
and concepts and it had a certain structure to it that we wouldn't recognize. First of all, we'd never really recognize it much in translation unless we knew what we were looking at. But if you were uh, a Jew of our Lord's time, you would have realized this was a perfectly composed and beautiful poem. And, it, and then of course the content for us even in translation is quite beautiful. Um, I want you to note that, see, what he does is he goes through this whole thing, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and goes through all these things, um, you know, the meek shall possess the land, they that mourn shall be comforted, the hunger and thirst for justice shall have their fill, and then it goes back down to the end as it began, um, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, okay? And... Um, I guess I won't, I could go into some explanation. Okay, so, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice it is poor in spirit, it's not just poor. Um, Paul VI and others, notably others, have misinterpreted this, or you know, presented it as if it meant blessed are the people who have no money. Okay? Um, that is not... Uh, what it means, it means blessed are those who have the spirit of poverty, who, who's, yeah, who have the spirit of poverty. And it doesn't mean the spirit of not having money. What it means is the spirit of divesting themselves of superfluous worldliness uh, for the sake of the kingdom, okay? So we start out then with blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. Now, the King James and other Bibles used currently by the modern Catholic Church have this ludicrous translation that says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Okay? Which you'll never figure out. You know, that you tell me what that means. You mean meek people are going to inherit the world are going to, you know, the world is going to be their property. It doesn't sound like it's much motivation to be meek, really, because who really wants the world anyway? And what it's talking, when, this is this is a more accurate translation. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. What land? The holy land. In in the the new heaven and the new earth, there they shall they shall possess the land that was promised to their ancestors, okay? Um, the new Jerusalem, et cetera, that's spoken of in the New Testament. So we have then, um, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, what does that mean too? It, once again, it all means something that happens in the afterlife. Uh, blessed are they that mourn, but mourn what? The loss of their cat? No. Blessed are they that mourn over the sins they've committed in this life. You see? And they shall be comforted because if they repent in mourning over their sins, then when they get to the afterlife, they're going to be comforted. They're going to have eternal life, you know, eternal rest, etc., as we say sometimes. Um, blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall have their fill. What does this mean? It means somebody who is just. Remember what just is. Giving to each person what is his own. What they have rightly coming to them. And first of all, that, that means God. We give to God first and foremost what he has coming to him. Uh, but also because of the first commandment of the, the commandment of charity to love God above all things and our neighbor as ourself for love of God. We give to each person what he has or he or she has coming to them in justice. That's the very definition of justice. Redere sum quique. Give to each that which is his own. And so what is yours? Your property? Your, your reputation, for example? A lot of people don't think of things like that. Your reputation is one of your most valuable assets. And so it is a great crime to commit calumny against anyone because you rob them of one of their most valuable possessions, which is their reputation, and is a great sin against justice, you see? So, uh, 
Yes, giving to each person what is his. So somebody who hungers and thirsts after that, uh, in this life, many times will, will not be satisfied. Because it, it's truly in this life, there is very seldom any real justice that is done either to ourselves or, or other people we know. And there can't be perfect justice in this world anyway. But where is there perfect justice? The afterlife. God will reward us. If we have suffered through injustices, God will make that up to us more than a hundred times over in the afterlife. So, uh, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. That's clear enough. The clean of heart, or sometimes pure of heart, um, for they shall see God. That's another um, one that's easy to figure out. The peacemakers. Um, the peacemakers is maybe not so obvious to some. The only true peace that someone can have is through Christ. Uh, the only real peace that you can have and keep is the peace of spirit, which is one of the gifts or fruits of the Holy Ghost. So if you truly possess the Holy Trinity living in your soul as the life of your soul, what we call the state of sanctifying grace, it has an effect on you. And it brings you a quality that is a, a peace that no one can take from you. I mean, you can, you can be physically disturbed, a lot of things. Like look at, look at the, the writings of St. Paul. I mean, he writes almost as if he's writing about someone else, about everything he, he's gone through sometimes. Um, you know, being thrown into jail so many times, so many lashes, uh, shipwrecked, you know, just everything that happens to him. But he's able to write, you can tell in his writing that he has the peace of Christ in him through all that. So when we say that the peacemakers, those who, they are they who, who attract people to the true, pre, the true peace of spirit that we're talking about that comes only from Christ and it's the only lasting peace. Um, persecution for justice sake, once again, those are who are persecuted for basically for their faith. And, uh, and that, that explains pretty well as well. All right, so then the rest of that is in pretty self-explanatory. Now I wanted to get to the first commandment. <coughs> um, and I want to say before I get into the commandments, Christians, even Jews, but except very strange branches of them, have always understood that the, the commandments, now we're, we're getting into the Ten Commandments, what they call the Decalogue, the ones that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. It's always been understood that those are, they're not restrictive. You can't have a fundamentalist understanding of the Ten Commandments. What I mean is, I'll take another thing out of scripture. Like, um, So I was talking with this Bible thumper down in Alabama when I was living down there. And we were talking about different scripture things and we were talking about, our Lord says, if someone strikes you on the cheek, you know, turn the other cheek, okay? And so I said to this guy, well, what would you do if he hit you on the shoulder? He says, I'd bash him back. Because the commandment, Christ said, if he strikes you on the cheek, you turn the other cheek, but not if he hits you anywhere else, okay? So that's the kind of thing you can't do with the commandments, is, is limited. That. Like, thou, thou shalt not kill doesn't, first of all, mean thou shalt not kill anything or anybody. Because there are, obviously, it's okay to kill animals and things like that for, you know, chickens and and steers and stuff to eat. So it can't mean thou shalt not kill anything. And also, um, self-defense and things like that, you kill somebody in self-defense, that's not even a venial sin. So it can't mean that either. Uh, so we have to, you know, say, well, it, what, what does it mean? It really means thou shalt not take an innocent life. And that's, but under that commandment, for example, to not kill is not just the killing 
uh, not just murder. Uh, there are a lot of things that come under every commandment. Like, if you drink too much and drive, you have violated the, the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Because you become a potential, hopefully not a, a, a real actual, but a potential instrument of murder at that point. And when, if you drink too much and drive knowing that you're, you shouldn't be driving, right? You, ha you have to confess violating the commandment, thou shalt not kill. Okay, because that's, that's very, very serious. So I'm just using that as an example because there are many things that come under each commandment and we're going to go over those. Not, you can't take it superficially and in the restricted sense that the commandment just means one thing. So, the first commandment is, <coughs> long version, I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Thou shalt not make to thyself a graven thing, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on the earth beneath. Nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth, thou shalt not adore them nor serve them. Okay, now fundamentalists have a field day with this one because they say, well, you Catholics have statues, right? And those are graven images. Uh, and that's forbidden under the first commandment or as they would say, the second commandment, because they, Protestants divide the first commandment into two commandments. They end up with 10 at the end. They stick two more together somewhere else along the way. Um, so let's get into that. What is commanded by it? It is commanded that we love, that worship the one true and living God by faith, hope, charity, and true religion. Okay. And that we don't worship anything else. You see, we, you can venerate something and that's not worship. Worship means you, um, you adore something in, in itself as the object of your adoration. Now, only God can hold that position where we, we can only worship God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, or Father or Son or Holy Ghost. Really, you can, you can worship them individually. But only Father, Son, and Holy Ghost can be worshipped. That means adored as the object of the, of the adoration. Okay? Um, everything else, we can venerate other things. We can hold them in respect, but you can only adore the one God, in, well, three persons in the one God. Okay? Uh, and that you should have clearly in mind. Because... A lot, uh, in Protestant circles, there's a lot of confusion. Um, they, they think when we're uh, praying in front of a statue that we are violating the commandment, um, both parts of it, to you know, the graven image part and also the uh, worshiping the, you know, uh, the one God. But it's neither. What the, we, and one way you can explain it to people is, I mean, and, and I hope, as a Catholic, you're, you're supposed to understand that too when you're kneeling in front of a, a statue. I'm not saying that some Catholics don't have the wrong idea. They might, you know, hopefully none of our people do. But um, So you can say, well, look at, um, you know, down in the park down there, there's a statue of George Washington on a horse, okay? And... Does that mean you know you're breaking the uh, first commandment when you when you go and look at that and read the inscription you know whatever father of our country fought this you know revolutionary war and this kind of thing to get us away from England? No, what it is is it's a a representation of George Washington and his horse to remind us of the deeds of someone who led the revolutionary war to found our country and his heroism and patriotism and, and all these things. We don't adore the statue. It, it's there to remind us of, of something that we have respect for in a sense. Now, with the statue of, the, of a saint, um, first of all, we don't adore the statue, but we, we as humans are visual creatures. Uh, we, when we're, if, we're, if I say, okay, pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary and ask her 
to, to, to pray to her son for you for um, the grace of final perseverance, for example, all right? Well, when I say pray, you pray and ask the Blessed Virgin Mary, you know, our minds are like, okay, either they'll do nothing or they'll, you know, they'll be a little bit, you know, in a quandary over that. But when we have a statue of a representation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, as human beings, that connects us with the, the heavenly person a lot easier in our imag imaginations for our prayer life, okay? And that's the extent of it. Um, in fact, the first commandment does not forbid making a graven image at all. Because if you look after where this is in scripture, a couple paragraphs later, God commands them to make a graven image, which is the bronze serpent on the poles. So he's not forbidding that. It's, it's the adoring of graven images as objects in themselves like the idolaters did. See, the idolaters made images of things and worshiped like they, you know, the sacred bottle of life-giving water, right? Okay? And then, oh, you know, hail the life-giving water. Because that's, that's what they would do. They would worship the thing they made as the object of their worship. Like the golden calf, remember? See, they weren't worshiping the god, you know, behind the golden calf. I, I can't imagine that they even thought there was one. They were worshiping the golden calf that they made. So, anyway, um, <coughs> we're on page 66 at the top. So we just did then, um, what are we commanded by the first commandment? What is the first commandment? And then sins against faith. Okay, so the sins against faith are believing in a false religion, willful doubt, disbelief, disbelief or denial of any article of the faith, and also culpable ignorance of the doctrines of the church. A culpable ignorance means you're ignorant of what the church teaches and it's basically your fault because you were too lazy to inform yourself on what the church teaches. Culpable means fault, like mea culpa, through my fault, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa, that's in the Confidior of Mass. It means <coughs> it's an ignorance that is your fault. And let me tell you before God, ignorance that is your own fault or our own fault is no excuse when you get to judgment. Um, that is a sin in itself. So you have to do your best to know what it is that your faith, your faith teaches or else that's a, a sin against faith. How do we expose ourselves to the danger of losing our faith? Okay, now this is really important because people who at some point have the faith treat it as something that they're never going to lose. This is never going to go, oh, I have the faith. Um, I don't have to do anything to safeguard it or protect, protect it. But there are certain things you can do to actually uh, put yourself in danger of losing your faith. So we are... We expose ourselves to the danger of losing our faith by sinning, failing to pray, failing to study our faith, neglecting our spiritual duties, reading bad books, going to non-Catholic schools, and taking part in the services or prayers of a false religion. And that's just a short, short list. I would add probably today, for the most part, going to Catholic schools, <laughs> schools that call themselves Catholic, and... In fact, they, they're not. Modern Catholic schools are as bad at, or worse than Protestant or secular schools. Certainly worse than, than secular schools. Because as Saint, uh, not Saint, as um, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, you know, his advice to his um, brothers and sisters, have worked, they, he, they were asking him, where do we send your nieces and nephews to college? He says, send, don't send them to a Catholic college. He said, send them to a secular college. He says, it is better for them to have to fight for their faith in a secular college than go to a so-called Catholic college and have their faith taken away from them. You see? And uh, there are very few colleges these days that call themselves Catholic that are actually worthy of the name. 
Um, in my time, you know, our parents thought that they were doing the right thing when they sent us the Catholic souls. They had no idea the Vatican II nonsense that had happened um, around the time of Vatican II and after. They thought we were getting a good education and of course found out only too late that we weren't. That they were feeding us all kinds of... I mean, think about it. Things were so bad that in my grammar school, I called the principal on one of her heresies in class and boy did I get in trouble. I got, but I, I, I just told her that's wrong, you know? I knew it was wrong. Um, I remember her, Sister Virginia, Sister Virginia Maloney, and she was talking about the Eucharist and how if everybody, oh, so I said, no, wait a minute, let me get this right, Sister. You're saying that if everything, if everybody thinks that the bread is the body of Christ, then it becomes the body of Christ? She says, yes. I said, no, that's a lie, that's wrong. And she called my parents and took me into the office. And I got in trouble, not only in the office, at home. But in the end, you know, I was right. And, and, but see, that's what we were being fed. And that was, was my second grade, you know, that that happened. So anyway, we'll just add so-called Catholic schools to places you can endanger your faith. Your faith is like... It's a precious thing. You know, I like one of my images. Does everybody know what a Fabergé egg is? Yeah? Tuck. Fabergé egg. Okay. They are these things that the Tsar of Russia had made as gifts for his Tsarina and for people in the royal family. And there was a famous jeweler named Fabergé, Karl Fabergé, in, in St. Petersburg. And they were sumptuous. They were just little things, but they were guilloshed, enameled over gold and, and rubies and diamonds and little things and everything. I mean, each one is worth millions now, millions and upon millions of dollars. And, you know, they, they're only egg-sized, most of them. Some are a little bigger. But the, the point is, it's an earthly thing. You can't take it with you. Yet, if they're going from say, now from Moscow or to New York for an exhibition, they don't just all pile them together in the toolkit, you know, and, um, and check them into the checked baggage and let the gorillas who throw around the baggage behind the scenes throw them around. They take a lot of care with it. They're fragile and they're very precious. And so they wrap them, you know, they, just everything, every care is taken with them. And that's how you have to treat your soul. You can't batter your soul about or expose it to the elements. You have to understand that, as the computer programmers used to say, garbage in, garbage out, okay? Uh, it's that way with your soul. If you want to preserve your soul to life everlasting, you can't feed it garbage all the time. You have to keep it away from the garbage. And you have to put it in a place where it can be nurtured and grow. So this includes the kind of music you listen to, the kind of people you hang around with, where you go even, television, these kinds of things. All of these things can have either a good or bad effect on your soul. If you have a good friend who's, who's a good person, a God-fearing, upright, just um, you know, person, then then having them around will be good for your soul. You can help each other in the ways of God. You can help to grow and to lead each other along the path that goes to heaven. Um, this is especially true later on when you get married of husbands and wives. This is what they should be doing, leading each other on the path towards God. And so, um, music. You don't have to listen to Gregorian chant all day long. In fact, I couldn't. I, I think most Gregorian chant is nice for about 15 seconds. And then I just, I can't bear it anymore. Um, and maybe in some moods I could bear maybe a little longer than that. But what I'm saying is you don't have, Gregorian chant isn't the only good music. You know, there's Mozart. There's, you know, other things. There's even later music that, that's, that's really good. And it's, it's, it's at least uplifting for your soul. Um, 
Bach, for example, the instrumentals, he, he shows forth to us, at least you know, in, in a particular way, um, the laws of God and their symmetry by the symmetry of his music and the composition and the way it's, way it's constructed in a beautiful manner. Those are all reflections of the divine harmony and the, the, the way God had built the universe. And so music should be um, uplifting or, or give you good thoughts, if not holy ones. You know, good thoughts, at least serene thoughts, and, and be kind of peaceful for your soul. It, it can also give you holy thoughts. There are wonderful compositions on holy themes that, um, you know, raise your spirit in, in a different way. So, and TV. As I said, when we're talking about statues, we are visual creatures. And you can't just put anything in. You know, the, the eyes are the window of the soul. Okay? And it's true. What goes in here goes into your soul. So if you're watching trash, then you're feeding the most precious thing you have, a steady diet of garbage. Um, how can that be good for you? It can't be. Eventually, that garbage goes into your soul and wears it down. So, what you watch on TV? You know, somebody who just sits in front of the TV and flips channels, is, that is the spiritual equivalent of reckless driving. Okay? You, you know, just, oh, we'll see what's on, we'll see what's on. You know, and they go, oh, Father, I was watching a program and there were some bad parts in it, so I guess I sinned. No. You sin because you sat down and watched a program that you're pretty sure there was going to be bad parts in. Okay? Um, I guarantee you, Julia Child is not going to scandalize you. I have all her DVDs, as many as you can get. Um, you know, this kind of thing. Or, or whatever. You know, a Snoopy's movie isn't going to uh, ruin your soul. Or the Song of Bernadette's not going to lead you to hell. But, but some of these other things, you know... Um, what sells on TV now? Well, I don't even have to say the word. You know what sells. So they don't make anything without it in one way or another. So the point of all this is you have to control your associations and your input. Um, your friends. You know, we've all had friends that we had to come to the point where we realized it wasn't good for us to keep that friend anymore. Um, that they had, you know, gone the wrong way and they, they weren't coming back and they were dragging us down with them. And no matter how long you've known somebody like that, you have to say, well, you, know, you try to bring them out of it, but, but still, you, you've got to save your soul at all costs. <clears throat> so that's exposing ourselves to the danger of losing the fame. Um, oh yeah, marrying outside the church. A huge danger to losing your soul. Huge danger. Because I've seen people get married. I've even had the husbands, you know, go through the convert class and then later, you know, well, it was just doing it, you know, for show kind of thing. And then stops coming to church. And then the wife stops coming to church because it's too inconvenient. And before you know it, they have a kid who they're not bothering to baptize. And before you know it, the whole family's on a bobsled down into hell, you know, headed in that direction. And it, so, it, you know, it starts with one thing and leads to another. It's a, something to be very, very careful. You know, think about it. Think of marrying outside the faith. So let's say mommy's, a, you know, whatever, a Zoroastrian and daddy's a Catholic. So they meet, and of course, they're the love of each other's life. But she is not converting from Zoroastrianism. Um, but she says, well, you can raise the kids in Catholicism if you like. Okay, fine. How is that kid really going to believe that outside of the faith? What is that? Oh. Our food is done. Okay, food is done. Stop. Let's go. I, how, are they gonna, how, are, how are you going to teach that kid how important it is to adhere to the Catholic faith for the salvation of their soul? If, if that same religion will teach them... If mommy doesn't convert, she's going to hell, and it's, you know, 
And they'd go, what, my dear, my mommy, you know, dear mommy is going to hell. Well, I'm rejecting your religion that says that. Your religion says mommy's going to hell? Forget it. I ain't belonging to your religion no more. Well, I would have to establish a few things before. Yeah, I would actually, in a way. Um, you mean they're, they're different from a different religion entirely, but they are another religion in, in many, many ways. And what I tell people who are marrying, like traditional Catholics marrying Nova Soto, I say, you establish right now that you all are going to this mass. You tell them before you get married, you are not going to that mass. You will never step foot in that Nova Soto church. You will not do it. Um, and make sure you are extremely and painfully clear on that before you get married. Okay. So, yeah, and then, then even sometimes there's a problem. But you want to, see, what I, what I look for in those couples then is that if they say they want to get married and one's in Nova Soto, that they're coming here every Sunday and, and I know they're here every Sunday. You see, and, and when they're not, I give a little ringy-dingy to see what's going on. Yeah. Oh, sure. You can go to Jewish weddings. You can go to Buddhist weddings. It, that, that part doesn't matter. You can, you can go live it up. Because, you see, there's no, there's no danger of scandal. Um, if you go to a Jewish wedding, they know everybody there is not a Jew. It's a wedding. You know, that's why when people come here for weddings, we tell them certain things, like Holy Communion is for practicing Catholics. Because we know they're... You know, there are a lot of people who are just, oh, isn't that nice? I'll go get the wafer in memory of the happy couple. You know, it's just a nice thing to do. And in fact, there was a problem I remember in a church in Santa Clara, and I knew the pastor. He was very conservative, but not traditional, traditional. And this woman, <coughs> um, she would, at, the, at weddings, she would receive communion, and then, then take, she'd take it in her hand, and then she'd put it, she had like a scrapbook. And, and she would, she would, you know, and, but she'd leave it in the pews. She had her special place. So finally the parishioners brought this little scrapbook that was just, you know, full glued in host to Monsignor Sweeney. This was in Santa Clara. And um, said, look it, she has, this is what she did. I mean, this is a problem of a communion in the hand, you know. I had one here whose mother-in-law, um, unbeknownst to the poor, people in the marriage, but went up for communion, took it out of her mouth and put it in the scrapbook, the wedding scrapbook. And then they, when they found this out, they go, what do we do? It's like, okay, I never had one of these before, but you know. um, anyway. So, so sins against hope then are presumption and despair. What's presumption? Presumption is presuming on the mercy of God. Assuming you're going to um, be able to go to confession and avail yourself of God's mercy and that everything's going to be okay. That you're going, you know, you put off, for example, confession because you, you, you were just, oh, well, I'm not ready yet and, and um, you know, God won't let me die before I do that and, and then, when I, you know, I'll confess someday. Well, and then you, like, die in a car accident on the way home, right? Because it doesn't always work that way. That would be the sin of, of presumption. And despair is believing that you're just probably so bad or you sinned so much um, that you can't be forgiven, so why bother? Why bother trying? Why bother going to confession or the sacraments, okay? <clears throat> despair is what the devil wants to drive you to more than anything is this notion of why, why bother? You know, I go to confession and the next week I'm doing it again. I might as well just give, I know better yet, I might as well end it all, right? Because I just, I'm no good. Why continue, okay? And so that would be a very sin against, a serious sin against hope. Sins against religion, chief ones are the worship of false gods or idols and the given to any creature whatsoever that honor which belongs to God alone. Okay, now once again, the worshiping of false gods. Um, does that mean that somebody actually has to put the happy Buddha statue on the table and bow before it in order to be worshiping a false god? No. Um, how about 
somebody who volunteers to take a Sunday shift, even though it means missing mass, um, just because it gets them a few more bucks, which they could actually live without. It's breaking, it's breaking the first commandment. That's worshiping money over doing your duty to God. Um, that kind of thing. All right. <clears throat> um, does the first commandment forbid the making of images? The first commandment does not forbid the making of images, but the making of idols. That is, it forbids us to make images to be adored and honored as gods. So somebody who works in a Buddha factory, if there's a Catholic who works in a Buddha factory, they better get out. You know, they're, they're in the wrong business. Uh, does the first commandment forbid dealing with the devil and superstitious practices? Well, of course. It forbids all dealings with the devil and superstitious practices, such as consulting spiritualists and fortune tellers and trusting to charms, omens, dreams, and similar fooleries. Okay, so if you look in the paper, they have your horoscope, right? It is not a sin for amusement to read your horoscope. Let's say that right off. Uh, I think it's entertainment, right? You, you realize that no statement that appears in a, a newspaper with a re readership of thousands or tens of thousands, can apply to everyone born in a particular period on that day. That their general statements, you know, um, somebody will be nice to you today, or, or whatever, or, or beware, do not sleep in a eucalyptus tree tonight, or something along, along those lines. Um, so, but what's, what would be a sin is if you really check the horoscope to run your life by that. I have to see where the stars are today. I don't know, is it, should I buy a car now? Should I wait? Because if the stars aren't right and I buy the car now, it might be a lemon, but if I wait until Saturn aligns with, with Jupiter, then you know I'll get a good car, maybe not a good Saturn, but, <laughs> but a good car, this kind of thing. If you run your life by the horoscope and, and stuff like that, then yes, that's superstition. Ouija boards, the most dangerous thing that anyone can buy in any store, probably. Um, you're better off getting your child a revolver, loaded, a loaded revolver, than getting them a Ouija board, literally. Um, How about feng shui? Feng shui? Feng shui? Well, that's just silliness, you, you know? <laughs> these, are, these are bad interior decorators making a killing on going over people's house and saying, oh no, you know, the chi energy is being, oh no, no, no. we have to, and, you know, and we have to have, you know, like a, a, a ball of, a, a ball of straw over here, and we have to have a little fountain, you know, whatever. I mean, that's just silliness. Oh yes, no, and you have to have your bed lined up north south, and you know, your doors, are, Okay, that, I, I just think that's chicanery. Those are people making a killing on gullible people who think there's something to it. Um, but, I mean, and it is maybe a slight sin against the first commandment if you think that aligning your doors will let in evil energy or something like that. You, you know? lose your money. Or you lose your money, will go out, yes, out, out the door because of the way it's set up. Well, of course, they're losing it anyway because they're paying a, a feng shui consultant on the side. All right, so, um, yes, charms, omens, dreams. Um, yeah, charms, like, you know, I've had this, this grouse foot, you know, since I was you know, little, my mother gave me this grouse foot and it's been... I always grasp it when I'm flying in airplanes or, or whatever. It's like a rabbit's foot or something like that. You know, in, in Scotland, it's a grouse foot that they use for that. Um, well, no, that's silly too. Oh, I can't get on the plane. I don't have my rabbit's foot. You know, I can't. We'll, we'll all die. I have to, 
I'll take the next plane. I just have to go home and get my rabbit's foot because, and, and things like that. Um, and that even, you know, I mean, that can even apply if the thing is, is, is Catholic in nature. You know, um, I mean, blessed medals and scapulars are an important part of our devotional lives. But you have to be careful to realize that oh, if you forgot to put your crucifix on that day, that it doesn't mean you're going to become possessed because that, that is just a reminder. You know, it's a blessed object, which is also a reminder of the sacrifice of Christ for our redemption. <coughs> but it is not what keeps you from being possessed. Don't do anything that you should not do um, that's dangerous for your soul and you won't get possessed. You don't get possessed, like the devil doesn't get to go eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and then boom, possess the person who forgot their crucifix that day. <laughs> so you, you don't want to be that way about any particular object. Um, okay, are all sins of sacrilege and simony also forbidden by the first commandment? All sins of sacrilege and simony, that is selling religious services, are also forbidden by the first commandment. So simony is not only selling religious services, it's, um, it's, it could be also selling um, uh, religious offices, okay? Like for example, somebody who just should never be a priest or should never be a bishop or whatever because they have no vocation whatsoever, but they win the lottery and they pay some mercenary bishop a um, million dollars if they'll ordain them to the priesthood, okay? And I guarantee things like that have happened. Well, the person does become a priest, but um, probably puts their, you know, everybody's put their soul in, da in danger to get there, which is not the way it's supposed to work. So that would be buying a religious office, okay? Um, once again, two people, let's say, come to me and in no way, shape, or form should they be married. And I, I, I would never do the marriage um, because there are problems that I can see are flaws with the relationship from the beginning or uh, problems in, canonically speaking. And they go, look, well, we just won the lottery. So we'll give you a million, uh, well, which actually wouldn't, wouldn't be enough. Um, let's say... <laughs> No, no amount actually would be enough. But let's, let's just pretend. They say, we will give you, we just won mega, mega millions and we have $400 million now. And we're going to give you $10 million if you will overlook all those things and marry us. Well, that would be basically buying, I mean, if I caved in, that would be buying a sacrament. Of course, I would most likely go to hell if I didn't repent, you know, at some point. Um, and so would they. So that would be an example of buying a sacrament. Yeah, but I would still have to live with doing the wrong thing before God, you know, marrying people that I just knew I, I couldn't marry under any circumstances. I wouldn't care where the money ended up. It, that the, problem, the, the real problem for me is that I went against my conscience and, and married people that I know shouldn't be married. So the, the amount would be what would never justify, even if it went to the church or whatever. then good luck. <laughs> go to the, you know, go to the little chapel of the trees in Vegas, you know. Or you won't even have to give them a million. Charge you What's that? Charge you they have them. So you think of what a killing I could make, right? <laughs> so like the golden arches of marriages in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's just not the way it's supposed to be. Um, is it forbidden to give divine honor or worship to the angels and saints? It is forbidden to give divine honor and worship to the angels and saints, for this belongs to God alone. So remember, only God is the object of adoration. You can only adore God. We venerate the angels and saints, which means they have a special place in, in, our, in our prayers and in our spiritual lives because of their sacrifice and their loyalty to God. They are the proven friends of God. 
And so they, de they deserve to be our friends and, um, and to have a place in our, in our lives as well, but not as the object of adoration. We really need to understand that. What kind of honor or reverence should we pay to the angels and saints? We should pay to the angels and saints an inferior honor or reverence, for this is due to them as the servants and special friends of God. What honor should we give to relics, crucifixes, and holy pictures? We should give to relics, crucifixes, and holy pictures a relative honor as they relate to Christ and his saints and our memorials of them. So, for example, um, a holy picture, especially one that's been blessed, um, we, because it's, it's a holy picture, we never just toss it in the garbage, for example. Um, you know, it isn't God, we're not adoring it, but yet as a representation of a holy person or thing, we don't just trash it. Now what I suggest, because there are times of the year where I'm just overwhelmed with, you know, the St. Jude Society sending me stuff for a donation, right? And I gladly keep all the stuff they send and I never send them a donation. But I'm left with these pictures of St. Jude or the Blessed Virgin Mary. And I mean, more than I can deal with or anybody can deal with, so I shred them. I mean, shredding them, then they're not the images anymore. You didn't treat them particularly disrespectfully. But still you realize you can't keep every one of these things. I mean, I, w I would have to have another house one to store all this religious stuff that I've received in the mail over the years and one to live in after a while. And that can't be God's intention that I do that. Uh, okay, just a couple more things and then we'll stop for our break. What honor should we give to... Okay, memorials, yeah. Do we pray to relics or images? We do not pray to relics or images for they can neither see nor help, or neither hear nor help us. But we do pray to those saints or holy people whom they represent for their intercession with God for us. So when we pray to a saint, an angel, or a, a human saint, we are asking them to pray to God for us. And we call that an exercise in the communion of saints. Um, as part of our faith, we don't treat people who have died and gone to heaven or even purgatory, as really separate from us. They're, they're part of the church. They, you know, the souls in heaven are, are the church triumphant, okay? The souls in purgatory are the church suffering, and the, the church on earth is the church militant. But we believe we all form parts of the same body. So that if I say, um, Eden, you know, I have a thing coming up, uh, I have a special intention, would you pray for me for this? And Eden would say, of course, I'll, I'll pray for you for that. Well, we do that too with the Blessed Virgin Mary. Um, we say, dear Blessed Virgin, ask your son for us for, for this special in, intention. Okay, now, um, we'll, we'll go on with, let's take our little break and we'll get back to it.